words from the gospel. Jesus stood still in the name of God, source, word, and life-giving spirit. Amen. In the Ask Michael event, I created a bit of controversy when I couldn't decide if I liked cats more than birds. I had said both, which is not really a good answer when you're asked what is your favorite animal. But don't worry, Juliet, I think it was Juliet, wasn't going to let me off the hook that easily. So we circled back, because you know you have to know, is the priest a bird man or a feline friend? So I thought today I would tell you a little bit about why I like birds. Yvonne bought me our first, or my first, bird feeder in 2015. We hung it from a tree branch, and instantly we had customers. Many different birds came, and that is kind of when I realized that I'd never really seen birds before. I would call Yvonne and say, there's a new bird at the feeder. It's very tiny. It's a black hat and white sides. And she would reply, that's a black-capped chickadee. It's very common, you know. And this is very true, because from my office, I can hear these little dynamos singing their telltale song, chickadee dee 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 every single day. A whole flock of birds with grayish backs arrived and started hopping on the lawn at the feeder. I called Yvonne again. Dark-eyed juncos. Again, a widespread and familiar visitor to feeders, and I should add pollinator gardens. On Friday afternoon, there were about 20 juncos fluttering between the pollinator garden and the platform, and I have to say, when I arrived this morning, they were still there. Another phone call. A woodpecker has arrived. That was easy to identify, especially because they smashed their head into the tree trunks. But there are nine woodpeckers in Ontario. From my office, I watched a downy woodpecker as it made its way up and down the tree outside the window. We were nearly eye to eye at one point. This is no surprise as the downy woodpecker is, you guessed it, also very common in Ontario. In fact, all three of these birds winter in Ontario and spend the summer here, and you can see them all year round. All of which prompts the question, how did I not see these birds before? They were right there in front of me all this time, but somehow I had missed them. Somehow I had only grasped sparrow, pigeon, seagull, and missed all of the other numerous species that call Toronto home. It's not like the birds were exactly hiding. They were doing what they always have done. And yet I was blind to their presence. Discovering that even in a city as large as Toronto, you are surrounded by hundreds of birds is both humbling and exciting. It's like a mixture of stupidity and fascination. When I read the gospel today, I wonder if that's how the disciples felt following Jesus. A bit of stupidity and fascination all mixed together. I think for the disciples, following Jesus would have been very exciting. Listen to this amazing teaching. Watch Jesus exercise demons. Be amazed as he heals the sick. Rejoice as Jesus outwits the authorities. But it would also be humbling. It's not comfortable to hear from your teacher, do you still not understand? Do you still not see? How long must I put up with this faithless generation, you of little faith? Not to mention those moments of complete disbelief. So you're telling me you want me to feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish? Or that time when Jesus got annoyed when the Sea of Galilee was about to swallow up the boat and drown them all. For the disciples, following Jesus is a case of seeing, but not necessarily understanding the whole picture. Today, our gospel brings us to the end of a journey that started in Galilee. Jesus and the disciples are leaving Jericho, the final stop 
before entering Jerusalem. The journey has been pretty punishing on the disciples. Jesus keeps talking about betrayal, suffering, and death. He warns the disciples, if you want to follow me, be prepared to find the same fate for yourself. It's not a lesson that is easy to grasp. And so here in the last scene before Jerusalem, we have a miracle that points to the disciples' blindness. Here we have a miracle that is meant for everyone who struggles to see how to walk the journey of discipleship. The miracle is meant to help us understand our gospel. And so today I want to comment on three things. First, Jesus' goal of establishing the kingdom of God. Second, the role of the disciples in establishing the kingdom of God. And third, the place of healing miracles and helping to understand the kingdom of God. In the gospel, Jesus struggles to establish the kingdom. The kingdom of God is best perhaps understood as the rule of God. So we can think of the rule of law in Canada, the rules that govern our common life together here in this city. In the scope of human history, I think that we can say it's not such a bad rule. In Jesus's time, the rule was the Roman, Emperor, the Roman Empire, definitely not as friendly as Canadian rule. Pretty oppressive if you were living in a conquered territory, a rule that, to be honest, didn't offer very much to the average person. Most importantly, it's a rule established on human understandings of power, a rule that establishes itself through destructive and oppressive powers. Now, with the arrival of Jesus, God has decided that it's time for a new rule. God has prophesied about this new rule through Isaiah. God has sent John the Baptist to prepare for this new rule. God rips apart the heavens and sends his Holy Spirit on Jesus, and God anoints Jesus to usher in this new rule. But the rule of God initiates conflict because it upsets human rule. God's rule is an, is an attempt to restore creation, to restore humans, to free us from the kind of oppression that was common in the Roman Empire and with the authorities in Jerusalem. So God's rule is in a collision course with human rule. In the gospel, Jesus will go to the unclean and to the sinful and will spread holiness and wholeness where society had declared boundaries and separation. In the gospel, God's rule will come from the margins and not from the center of power, a woodworker in Nazareth replacing the temple authorities in Jerusalem. But in the gospel, God's rule will also be limited. It is not yet come in full power and glory. It remains hidden, and Jesus is limited. God does not grant Jesus the authority to force God's rule on humans. God's rule is intended to use power to serve others, not to dominate them. And this places Jesus in a delicate situation. Jesus has the authority to denounce human oppression, but he does not have the authority to stop the oppressors. It also places the disciples in that same difficult situation. The disciples respond to the invitation to join Jesus in establishing the rule of God. Naturally, they assume that by being close to Jesus, by being in his inner circle, they will get to share in the power of Jesus. However, they make a mistake about how Jesus is going to usher in the rule of God. The disciples fail to grasp that God will act in God's terms and not human terms. Jesus will invite the disciples to imitate him. That means to use and trust the power given by God and not to rely on human power. 
Instead, we find the disciples still thinking in human terms. On the road to Jerusalem, Peter rebukes Jesus for suggesting he will suffer. The disciples argue about who is the greatest. James and John, they ask to sit at Jesus' left and right in glory. The disciples prevent the children from meeting Jesus. They prevent an unknown disciple from performing an exorcism in Jesus' name. The disciples fail to see after each prophecy of suffering and death and resurrection, and they misunderstand God's rule. The disciples fail to see that they, in fact, are seeking power in the same way the authorities seek power. They are seeking to be the greatest and not the servants. They're failing to live out the values of God's rule and instead competing for positions of honor and power. The disciples end up being blind to understanding the values of the new kingdom. The rule of God has also brought Jesus into conflict with non-human forces that threaten and oppress people. Satan, demons, illness, nature. After Jesus is tempted for 40 days in the desert, he emerges as the victor over Satan. As a consequence, we see Jesus gain authority over unclean spirits. He goes around in his ministry demonstrating this victory time and time again. Satan is, in fact, not the last enemy defeated, but the first one. And each demonstration of Jesus' healing power reminds us of this victory. In the rule of God, we see Jesus acting to destroy unclean spirits and liberate people. In fact, demons are not very different in our gospel from the human rule that Jesus wants to replace. The demons represent the desire to dominate others, the instinct to save themselves by destroying the lives of those that they control. But time and time again, our gospel demonstrates that Jesus is far more powerful than the demons. Jesus holds a similar power over illness and disability and other non-human forces that oppress and diminish people. In a culture where illness was generally understood to be a consequence of sin, Jesus says that it is God's will to liberate people from this understanding. So Jesus removes leprosy, heals illness, cures afflictions, reverses paralysis, restores sight, hearing, and a withered hand. In Galilee, where Jesus begins his ministry, these healings are meant to demonstrate that Jesus has authority to restore creation. He has authority to restore humanity and to demonstrate that in the rule of God, illness shall be no more. But on the road to Jerusalem, the healings and the exorcisms, they almost stop. Just two times Jesus will heal, and both times the person is blind. And although the purpose of Jesus' healing in the kingdom of God has not changed, these two healings are meant to comment on the stories that surround them. The healings serve to invite us to understand the failure of the disciples to see what Jesus is teaching them about the rule of God. The point seems to be that while Jesus has complete authority over non-human forces like demons and illness, difficulties will arise when he tries to teach people. Jesus does not have authority to control people. Controlling people is how human rule works. Divine rule, while powerful, has no power to force. And so we see how Jesus cannot heal or exercise when that depends on someone's, someone's faith in the power of God. In his hometown, where there is no faith in Jesus present, he can do very little. But Bartimaeus is different. Bartimaeus cries, have mercy. And we know Jesus will have mercy because, the rule of, because in the rule of God, restoration from illness is breaking into the world. 
Jesus does have the authority to heal, but it has to be Bartimaeus who cries out, and Bartimaeus who decides to follow on the way after he is healed. As readers, we're not told if the disciples understand this healing, nor are we told if they understand how the healing points to their blindness. But as followers of Jesus, we are asked to see this hidden rule of God at work in our lives. We are asked to put our trust in it. We are asked to live in the knowledge that God's power and God's authority are working to restore creation and restore humanity, but also to understand the limitations of God's power. It's difficult to see a hidden kingdom that is before our eyes, but beyond our sight. It's kind of like a bird kingdom that was always there before our eyes, but beyond our sight. Amen.